Hi, and welcome everyone to the Garden Hour for March. We're really, really happy that you guys are with us. I don't know about you, but the sun is finally shining for me today. We're having a lot of cloudy skies for about a week. Um, I've got that itch. The temperature is growing and getting warmer, and I just really want to get outside and play in my yard. And I'm sure a lot of you are feeling the exact same way. So we're happy to have you here. We're happy to, to answer your questions. So I'm Debbie Kelly. I'm the horticulture specialist in Jefferson County, and that's just south of St. Louis. We're really happy that um, you're here so we can answer your questions for you. Here is a list of all of us that are the horticulture specialists across the state. You will notice that we finally have up in the yellow section, a new specialist that is being hired and he will start with us at the beginning of June. So we're happy to have him. Again, we still have an opening down in the Southeast and then we have Boone County, which we're going to have. Um, hopefully the announcement for that will come out soon and people will apply and, and hopefully we'll get that, that position filled as well. But we're happy to have you all with us. Um, we have changed, um, Druba is on with us and he has changed his name to ask your questions now are here. And so if you've got a question you would like for us to answer, or if you've got a question of one of our small presentations, uh, go ahead and click on his, his name, which is ask questions here, type in the question, and then he will make sure that that question is being brought to us. And we'll go ahead and answer those questions for you. We have uh, Tony Lupo is with us. He's going to start us off here, get us kick started with talking about the weather. So Tony, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Yes, I it see it like, just fine. Thank you. Looks like it shared successfully. Excellent. So um, you opened up by talking about seeing the sun and it's brilliant and beautiful, but unfortunately, that's only going to last for a little bit of time as I've got a little bit of bad news in the immediate forecast, but uh, Let's talk about it. Okay, so let me get. Okay, so here's where we were yesterday, and it looks like my temperature scale's not showing on the bottom here, but uh, we were in the uh, 40s and 50s for most areas uh, under south of I 70, and then above I 70, we were mainly in the 40s. And the temperature change had been a nice upswing from what was uh, what happened on Monday. And we're going to continue to see that kind of an upswing today. But again, that's only going to be temporary. Uh, here's how much precipitation we've seen in the last 30 days since I've joined you. And this is the good news. We've seen precipitation down south and in the boot heel. And even in central Missouri, we've seen anywhere from around uh, two and a half to three and a half inches uh, across much of the state. And that's helped to drive drought conditions out of Missouri. And that's the, the best news I have for us since coming on to talk last time. And most forecasts uh, look like we're in a pattern now where we're gonna see storms riding up uh, across I-44 and onto the Northeast and dropping precipitation on us for the foreseeable future. Here's the, the drought monitor maps. And I put up last, night, last month to remind you of where we were with the drought. We still had some drought conditions in Missouri a month ago. And as of yesterday, Drought is out of most of Missouri, except for one or two counties in the Southwest. Now, the thing about having this dryness just to the West of us is it could set up the possibility because this is typical this time of year, this is our thunderstorm season, severe weather season, that we might see some severe weather pop up uh, in our part of the woods, at least more often than we might like. Uh, and the last few years have been quiet, but the good news about severe weather is that it does come with rain, so we'll continue to see our soils improve. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, for March, temperatures are running close to normal right now, uh, maybe a little bit above normal, believe it or not, uh, even though last weekend was quite chilly. And precipitation on, on that side of things were a little bit on the wet side. So I'm actually uh, encouraged because, again, that's going to help with our, our soil moisture. And why? Why? What's changed? Here's how, where we were in February. If you were with us a month ago, ridging over the continental United States, bringing warmer conditions to much of the east. Where are we now? The pattern has seen a wholesale change. You can notice that we don't have a very strong ridge or trough pattern across the United States. And that's allowed for the progression of systems across the country. And it's given us this uh, pattern where the uh, pressures aloft are less than normal. And that generally equates to colder. When, when you see colors like this, it equates to colder than normal conditions. But Alaska, Greenland, and those areas have been above normal. But Unfortunately, that's not Missouri. So I'll give you the quick lowdown on the forecast, what I'm expecting over the next uh, one to seven days. Uh, the, the folks at NOAA are thinking that Missouri is going to have decent rain Thursday and into Friday. That's our next weather maker. And that it'll be enough to produce, again, anywhere from Oh, around 0 0.5 inches to about an inch and a half. So uh, some more rain is coming our way. That's good news. And then we won't see rain until next Thursday. Six to 10 day outlook. Again, temperatures are going to continue to be a little bit below average for March. And we can't help that given the pattern we're seeing. And the uh, conditions will be on the wetter side of normal even though uh, we're gonna get all that rain on Thursday and Friday. And it'll probably even start very late Wednesday night. So uh, you can see, uh, I don't know if uh, folks follow the news and I don't know how far out of Missouri I wanna go, but you see the effect of these atmospheric rivers that are pounding California right now. Uh, and some of that moisture may make it into our region. The three to four week outlook, which a month ago forecast the cooler than normal conditions we're seeing, uh, is also projecting that late March, early April will be a tad below normal and that the rains will be okay, or at least rain wise will be okay by then. So a continuation of these cooler conditions uh, for early spring, right? And my forecast, uh, if you're already growing things, cover them. If, you're are, if you've already got things out, cover them. We're gonna get some pretty hard frost even down south. So uh, I think some rain Thursday night, it may mix with snow north of I-70. And uh, we'll generally see an, less than an inch because the ground is so warm right now. But uh, generally uh, about uh, 0 0.25 to 0 0.75 inches of rain. So enough to keep us moist. And, and that's what we like to see at this time of year. Gentle rains, just enough, and then they move out. Temperature wise, we're gonna get a nice break today upper 50s, low 60s, and even tomorrow. But then thir Thursday night, the mercury is just going to bottom right out. And we'll see temperatures in the 20s from Friday morning to Monday morning. And even the teens, Friday and Saturday night, especially north of I-70. So some pretty hard freezing conditions. You've got things that are sensitive and they're outside already. Cover them up if you don't want them to get hurt. Uh, I think things will warm up by the middle of next week and we'll see temperatures that are more typical for the time of year. So any questions for me? 
Yes, uh, we have one question about soil temperature, uh, soil temperature data. So uh, the question was, will Dr. Lupo go over soil temperature data? And uh, if not, where can we find that? So that is about the soil temperature data. And I pull out from a website that is from the ag, uh, ebb.mizori.edu. Oh, yes, yes, that uh, is where you yeah. can find it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, yeah, so I am going to copy and uh, put the link here for everyone. Yeah, the, all of our mesonet stations, or at least most of them, have soil uh, temperature sensors. And if, if you need more information, you can probably get it also from the Midwest Regional Climate Center. And uh, I'll get the address for that and type it into the box uh, when the rest of the program is, while the rest of the program is moving on. So. All right, that's that's all the questions we have, Dr. Lupo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you, Tony. We appreciate that you're here providing us with all this great information. Um, it really helps us as gardeners in our backyard and if we have a community garden we work in or wherever we might be. So thank you for joining us. And we always look forward to this each week. What I'd like to do now is go ahead and turn this over to Kelly McGowan. She is going to be our moderator for today. All right, thank you, Debbie. Uh, we've got some great topics to cover today on a wide array of subjects. And the first one is about watermelons. And the question is, how can I tell if a watermelon is ripe and ready to pick? And Dr. Trinkline will answer this for us. Uh, thank you, Kelly. There frankly are a number of ways by which we can judge the ripeness of melon. Of course, as the saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. But by the time we've sliced the watermelon open, it's too late if it wasn't ripe. Uh, believe it or not, the thumping method, and that's using your knuckle to thump on the melon and listen to the sound, can be uh, quite accurate. I guess we'll say in the ears of the expert. You'll find that a ripe melon usually has a more hollow, ringing sound to it, whereas melons that are not yet mature will have a more solid, somewhat higher pitch sound. I only mention this because perhaps before your home garden melons ripen, you wanna go and purchase one. This is a quick and easy way to judge the relative ripeness. As far as the home garden melons are concerned, better to use two tried and proven that have to do with the melon and the plant it's growing on. The bottom part of a wilder melon is called the belly patch. That's simply the part of the melon that had been sitting on the ground during the course of the growing season. That belly patch, because it doesn't receive sunlight, does not develop pigment consistent with the rest of the melon, green, striped, or so forth. An immature melon will have a white belly patch. If you carefully turn the melon, making sure not to hurt its stem, and you see that the belly patch has turned to kind of a creamy yellow, this is a good indicator that the melon is approaching or at maturity. Probably the third is the most important. There is a little, it's called botanically a tendril. It looks somewhat like a corkscrew that's attached to the watermelon vine across from where the stem of the melon is attached. If that tendril is still green, the watermelon is not yet mature. When the watermelon matures, that tendril dries up concurrently with the watermelon maturing. So again, thumping it in kind of a uh, general way, look at the belly patch. It should be a creamy yellow. And then by all means, find the tendril. If it isn't dried up, wait to harvest. 
If it is dried up, you're good to go. That's all I have, Kelly. All right, thank you very much. Okay, our next question is about um, store-bought soil, bags of soil, and the question is, is the quality of soil deteriorating? Uh, the question was about some soil that this person had purchased. They were afraid that maybe it was lacking in nutrients, wasn't supporting the health of their plants. And uh, Debbie is gonna talk to us about this. Yeah, hi, the question came in and we, we got it yesterday. And so we didn't have a whole lot of time to put that a po little PowerPoint with some information on it together. So it's just gonna be a little bit of a discussion um, that I thought I would bring up is that first of all, it's really hard to, to answer this question because we will then have lots of other questions we're going to ask in return. So what type of soil did you did you actually purchase? Was it actually topsoil that you purchased? Um, was it a soilless medium? Um, were there any nutrients that were added into that bag that you purchased? And if so, it should have those nutrient numbers on that bag so that you know what it is. The other thing is that in the past, we have seen uh, bags of, of soil where it has been contaminated with a variety of herbicides that even though they it may have some compost in, in that um, bag, so the, that compost then mixed in with that soil would then have that herbicide still in it because it doesn't go through and process out as it goes through that composting. Um, I know it is as a, a family of Grazon and Dr. Trink lines on, so he can talk a little bit more about that concept of, of the, the Grazon family that's still in there. And I know I talked a little bit with Donna, so Donna, do you want to have some comments that you might like to add? And then I'll ask Dr. Trinkline if, if he'd like to add some, some additional comments about the herbicide carryover. Yeah, I think it's like Debbie said, it really matters uh, uh, which soil that you're talking about. No set soil is truly dead. There is something to it, you know, whether it still has the uh, organism still in it, uh, may have some fertility in it, nutrients in it, uh, minerals. So no, no soil is truly dead. So, you know, I've had this question come in a few times here lately, but I think it matters about what you're buying. Is it a peat moss based potting mix? or is it a potting soil or is it some bag um the cheap stuff that sits out on the parking lot that's three dollars a bag so i think it really does depend on what you're talking about the other thing is you know um gardeners um find that plants are not sustained by a potting soil well is when you're when you think about a plant being sustained is it for three weeks you think it should be sustained for three weeks eight weeks 12 weeks is the plant starting to look peaked by the time eight weeks rolls around? So I think there's a lot of questions, as Debbie was saying. We could load you with questions about what's happening. And I think that's where it's good to reach out to one of us and say, hey, you know, talk me through this. Let, let's, let's see what's going on. Great. And Dr. Trinkline, did you want to add anything? Well, on about I, I think you've done a good job. Just one or two considerations. Look at the label of the bag to see that it has soil i'll not use the term dirt that makes horticulturist angry soil in it and if it does let's remember that soil had to come from the earth somewhere and bottom soil from river bottoms often contain residual herbicides so just because it's store-bought doesn't mean that it's herbicide free some of the herbicides used by corn farmers, they're called the triazines, or very long live. And while they might not kill the garden plant you're growing in it, it might stunt it or so forth. Worry me, and it has some, quote, uh, bottom soil in it, I almost said dirt, bottom soil in it, then I would maybe purchase one bag first and do what we call a green, bean assay is simply as taking a small pot and putting some beans in the soil in question, letting them germinate and allowing them to grow. Green beans are a good canary in the coal mine with regard to quickly telling us whether or not herbicides might be present. 
So after you looked and seen that there are no herbicides based on the growth of the green beans, then you can go back and look for the same batch number. Take the bag along and look for the same batch number that uh, your uh, tested soil came from. Uh, other than that, I know that a lot of companies have now gone to calling soilless mixes potting soil. And it really should be called potting mix because many of the blends have no native soil in them. That's about all I have, Debbie. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, Donna, for your comments as well. Kelly, I'll turn this back over to you. All right. Thank you very much. And before we get into our uh, next Kelly. Talk, yes. Uh, so uh, we have a question about uh, uh, about the watermelon. So that is from the YouTube. Okay. So are there any tips for growing watermelon in clay soil? So the person said uh, he is not uh, been successful and the plant was very small and pathetic. Right, in right. Clay soil. Watermelon is deeply rooted and it's very difficult for a plant to establish a deep root system if their soil is tight and clay-like. The best thing that we could recommend, and it's going to take time, is to improve that clay soil with the addition of organic matter on an annual basis. We probably can only incorporate effectively about four inches of well decomposed organic matter in one growing season. So we'll have to start somewhere, but doing that season after season after season will help the soil structure. And it's the soil structure that dictates drainage, porosity, and so forth. Uh, I know it's kind of discouraging, but on the other hand, the only alternative would be to build a raised bed and of course purchase a mix of native soil along with other amendments, or you could in a raised bed grow the uh, watermelons in a soilless medium. One final tip to grow sweet watermelons. Don't irrigate after the melons start to size on the vine. I, we can't prevent rain, but on the other hand, if you irrigate right up until the time they become mature, you will dilute the sugars. You'll have a, hard, a larger melon, but you're gonna be diluting the sugars in the melon and it won't taste as sweet. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Twinkline. So Kelly, that's all I have uh, in the chat box. Okay, and it looks like we have another uh, question that came in the chat about soil. Uh, what about using a broad fork to help incorporate organics into the soil? And I would say, yes, that's certainly a good option. Um, if you've never used a broad fork before, know that there's a lot of muscle that goes into that, but um, they do work well for this type of project. So good question. Okay, our next topic is about one of my all-time favorite plants, African violets. And Donna is gonna tell us how to propagate African violets. Okay, hey, thank you, Kelly. Um, so yes, I agree with Kelly. This is probably one of my all-time favorite topics, uh, well, the propagating and as well as the African violets. Um, and I'm just um, going to run through a simple way that you can propagate um, the violets. They're super easy. Uh, first and foremost, it's uh, very important to start out with healthy plants. Um, at the top of the top picture, at the very tip top, there's some scraggly looking violets. <laughs> Those are mine because they don't get enough light. Um, but they are, they still have a nice green color. They still are okay to take cuttings off of, but I would really rather them look like the photo below where the plants are more compact. They're lush green. They're blooming well. That's what you want to target on taking cuttings. 
The other thing is uh, any container that you put the cuttings into, you want to make sure that those containers are clean. And 10% bleach or Lysol spray, you know, um, anything that will clean out any uh, fungal pathogens or any bacterial pathogens that could cause a rot. The other thing is that you need a potting media. And we just uh, mentioned earlier about the difference between potting soil and potting mix. Well, in this situation, you want to use a potting mix or you can use a peat uh, perlite mix or a 50-50 ver uh, vermiculite perlite mix. So lots of different combinations that you can use for a potting media. The big thing that you want it to do is to be well-drained because you don't want those cuttings to be sitting um, in a soggy mess because it's going to cause rot. So just make sure it's well-drained. But and on the flip side, you want it to hold enough moisture that it will allow it to root, the leaves to root. Um, on African violets, generally, we don't need rooting hormone. However, some people like to use it because it can speed up rooting and it can help with the number of roots that are produced. But for the most part, with violets, you don't need it. Um, with other plant materials, um, yes, likely, but not with African violets. And then the, the last thing you need is a suitable environment. So what we want is a higher humidity environment that will keep the leaves from transpiring or stressing. And that way it gives that plant time enough to put on those roots and produce um, baby plants. And I'll run through that here pretty quick. So the top picture, I have cell packs, I have um, the um, peat pellets, um, you can, you definitely, you can use peat pellets. I typically don't like the peat pellets for propagation because they run cold. So you would need maybe a heat mat underneath or, um, you know, something to help, uh, warm that, those plants because they want to be, um, they want to be warm. That warmth will promote the rooting. Um, and then of course, at the top of the tray, I have, um, the perlite is over to the right and the middle is the vermiculite and over to the left. I know you can't see it well, but that is the um, potting mix. And so it's just a peat moss based potting mix. Any of these will do. Let me get my slides to go. Right, there we go. Just a closer um, example. Whoops. Okay, there we go. Um, the, the closer look at the, at what, what the medias are. You know, once again, they need to be well-drained, but they need to hold that water. And that's why a peat perlite mix is attractive because you have the vermiculite that's going to hold the water, but you're going to have the uh, perlite that's going to help the, with the drainage. And so a 50-50 mix of those two items would be great, but you can also use a potting mix, just keep it on the drier side. Um, but these are just my three favorite um, components when talking about propagation. Now, question I always get is, can I propagate African violets in water? Yes, you can. But I will be honest with you, there's a lot of stress that goes in between um, switching from water to a potting mix when those roots have already been developed. They're used to that water. And so sometimes you can lose a plant or have a hard time acclimating it to um, that soil or that, that, that soilist mix. So yes, you can technically do it in water, but I would say the soil or the soilist mix would be better. The process is pretty simple. Um, I know in this uh, situation, I did use the rooting hormone. Like I said, you don't have to. If you use rooting hormone, make sure to put a little out on a paper towel. Do not dip your cuttings in the bottle because you contaminate your whole bottle. But if you'll just tap some out on the paper towel, you can dip into the paper towel. And then once you're done with that rooting hormone, throw it away. You're not going to put it back in the bottle. So what you want, you can either take leaf cuttings without the petiole or you can take root cuttings or leaf cuttings with the pet petiole. Doesn't matter. Same process will happen. With you know, the second picture on the top, I have taken a leaf cutting with a petiole. Um, the third picture is showing how I've taken it off. Um, and, and really, you want several leaves taken off, not just one. And that's what, what my main focus is here. You want to usually take five or six cuttings and that way if one deteriorates or one doesn't root well, then you've got the other ones that have done well. Once you have taken that cutting and dipped it in uh, rooting hormone, then you wanna stick it into the soil. Um, you can 
stick it up to the base of the leaf. Um, and then, of course, then the bottom picture, I'm showing that I'm starting in, them in different containers. So actually, I started some of them in a four pack. I started some of them in a four inch pot. And also I started them in a, in a small open pack. Either container is fine. The biggest thing is that, that, that you have to make sure of is that they're clean and there's no other plant residues that would cause a disease um, or cause the leaves to deteriorate. Okay, so once we've done that, once we put them in the pot or the open tray, we're going to water them in and then we're going to put a dome over them to hold that humidity in. And, and I did it in several ways just to show you that one, you can recycle um, things uh, just like these containers I have, or you can use actual pots and cell packs. So I like the um, food clamshells because they will snap shut and they will give you that high humidity environment um, without and in your recycling. But you can also use a baggie. And all I did here was slip that four inch pot into the baggie after it was watered and I zipped it closed and it works really well. So this is, uh, I did this in February, mid-February. Um, and then by, um, I'm sorry, mid-January. We started in mid-January. By mid-February, we had developed roots. And then, of course, by March 15th, which is, yes, or today, <laughs> this morning, um, you can see that babies have been started. So it's not just about rooting um, the leaf. You really need to put that, leave that leaf in there long enough that you get the baby violets. And so once they've started to get a good size on them, you can actually take the old leaf off because that root system is well established. Um, as you can see, the adult leaves, they start to yellow. They start to, in some cases, brown. Um, don't be panicked about that. Um, what, what you're focused on is the, the new plants that are, that are coming off those leaves. And so really you're going to dispose of that um, old leaf. So just... At this point, um, I will probably go back home and I will um, pot these up in several pot, uh, separate pots. So I think out of the 10 or 12 leaves I did, I may have eight plants come out of it. So always be aware, take more cuttings than what you need because you never know how many are going to deteriorate and have issues. Okay, so that is all I have. So uh, back to you, Kelly. All right, thank you, good information. Okay, so the next uh, subject that we're going to talk about today is something we get a lot of questions on this time of the year, and that is about planting potatoes. And Katie is going to tell us a little bit about that. All right, uh, so uh, I too enjoy uh, African violets, and I just restarted a few of mine at home too, so that's another favorite of mine. Uh, so today, Irish potatoes, uh, you know, the um, old saying is that you plant your Irish potatoes on the uh, on St. Patrick's Day, which is this Friday. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So some history of Irish potatoes. Um, they're a tuber forming plant. They were native to Andean regions of South America, uh, taken to uh, by the early settlers to Europe, and uh, so so that history actually came started here before uh, they got the name Irish potatoes. Uh, they are among the top five vegetables grown worldwide. They have a pretty sterile flower, and uh, they need to be propagated vegetatively. So, in the home garden, what does that mean? Uh, we'll we'll talk about that. So many um, shapes and colors. Most people are uh, just familiar with uh, white or red potatoes, but there's lots and lots more options out there. Of course, the white skinned, white fleshed are probably the most common uh, and the red skinned or uh, red flesh. And uh, we have some blue skin ones with blue flesh and uh, some, uh, some more variety. We have uh, early development, 100 days, medium, 120 days, or late. Your main crop is 130 days. So they are a long season crop in the garden. They do prefer slightly acidic soils, uh, so 6 to 6.5. Uh, if we get higher pHs, sometimes we can have some problems with them. 
they like fertile, well-drained soils, high organic matter. Uh, so uh, sometimes our soils can also be a challenge for them. Uh, and uniform soil moisture is important, uh, just like with most of our vegetable crops. Uh, so planting, our planting dates, depending on where you live in Missouri, can be anywhere from March 10th, so that's before St. Patrick's Day, or to April 15th. And I personally have planted potatoes even a lot later than that because that's when the soil conditions were right and I had time to do it. Uh, we want to use certified seed stock. Um, those are the tubers. Uh, so um, I, I've seen advertisements already that um, seed potatoes are available in local stores. So basically that seed stock is potatoes and we cut those potatoes into pieces. So they need at least one eye, which is, you'll be able to see it. It's a, it's a, a spot on that potato. And in my picture over here, uh, these are where the eyes are or where those sprouts are coming from. So uh, if you uh, have the opportunity and think about it ahead of time, ideally you would cut these pieces like in this uh, picture and cure them for two to three days. A lot of times that doesn't happen for me personally. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, I have an opportunity, let's plant potatoes. So um, they get cut up and planted at the same time. Uh, plant 24 inches apart, um, three to five inches deep in furrows. We want to put the cut side down. So this bottom picture, you can see a uh, line of potatoes. And then we want to apply additional uh, nitrogen when the plants flower. So potatoes are hilled. And what hilling means is uh, basically um, we come back and we add soil. So um, after the, the previous picture where those were planted, I uh, would take a hoe and hill from both sides. So we have a small hill, but then as the plants grow, we continue to hill um, because that encourages more um, tuber production, which is what we want. And uh, we also protect those from the sun. Uh, also, uh, so you can see a picture of that as a kid. My job was to hill the potatoes. Uh, so so um, I had my favorite hoe and uh, that's how I uh, would go about hilling potatoes. I uh, also have a picture of potatoes here. These are heavily mulched in my parents' uh, vegetable garden. And this front one here, you can see critters also like them. That's some deer damage um, nipping off the tops. Then we harvest uh, new potatoes. Um, so those have thin skin and small, um, they, when they're large enough to eat. So we can kind of start peeking and seeing what's there. Uh, typically we dig the main crop about two weeks after the tops die. That allows them time to um, cure a little bit in the ground. When we dig them, we want to avoid skinning them. Uh, we also want to avoid exposure to the light. And after we harvest them, we want to cure them uh, for about uh, uh, for several days at 45 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit and high humidity. Uh, the other thing I had a call about one year was um, they didn't understand as far as curing potatoes go that they turn green. So when you cure them, you actually, uh, growing up, I should take some pictures of this. We always put them in um, like soda flat boxes, spread out in a single layer, and then we cover that with newspaper and allow those to cure before they are stored in a dark spot. And then commercially, uh, if you have a bunch, this is a, a commercial digger that is showing uh, all of those potatoes. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Katie. Okay, next up is our insect friend or foe. And Tamara, what do you have for us today? Fantastic. So yeah, we have friend or foe today. Um, I am gonna launch the poll. Take a look at this insect and tell us whether this is a friend or foe. Now I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds. All right, votes are coming in. You have about three seconds left. Okay, I am gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. 
So it looks like most of you said that this is a faux. And honestly, I agree with you. So this is the, uh, it's a pantry moth. Um, it's also known as an Indian meal moth. There are a couple other uh, meal or pantry moths that are out there, but this is the main one. And so just, just very quickly, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about the Indian meal moth. And, and really about pantry mouths in general. So preventing and eliminating infestations of stored product pests. Uh, there's there's um, a lot that we, we can do. And um, the, the most important thing for you to do is to try and keep them out. So prevention is, is the most important. And then keep in mind that the tips I'm going to give you will help you minimize the risk of infestation. It won't 100% um, guarantee it uh, because they are pretty uh, sneaky insects. So um, here's some prevention tips. Make sure that you check out the food before you purchase it, especially if it has a clear window. Look in, in it and see if you can see any of this webbing um, or if you can actually see a moth. If you see that, do not bring it into your home. Once you have food in your home, make sure that you use the older products first. So make sure you're rotating your your uh, food that you have in your house um, so that you're, you're there's not as much of a chance for if the eggs are in there for some reason that they won't have a chance to develop. Make sure that you store all of your food in, um, in airtight containers. Uh, and, and if anything does spill, make sure that you clean that up so that if, if you do happen to get any of these moths, they won't have anything to eat. And then um, I, I often hear about these insects and, and people are telling me they're doing everything right and they've cleaned everything up. But the thing is, is these don't just come from the store. They can also come in from outside. So make sure that you've screened your windows and doors and that you have adequate vent ventilation as well. If you do happen to get them, uh, make sure that you're identifying it properly because there are certain techniques that work for some insects and not others. Um, uh, make sure that you take a look in your pantry and see if you have any infested food. If you do, make sure that you discard it. Uh, don't just put it in the trash. Make sure you take that bag, seal it up, and take it outside too. Again, keep all of your food in airtight containers. Uh, this is important, you know, as preventative, but also if you find that you have an infestation, it's very important that you do it then too. Um, again, clean out the clean thoroughly uh, if if you do find that you have it, and that includes using a vacuum um, to get in between the corners and cracks, and then also uh, use use a, a a cloth to be able to get everything else out. This isn't just something that affects human food. One of the most common ways to get it is actually from pet food, so uh, bird seed, um, cat food, things like that. I recommend you keep those outside um, or in your garage, not in with your, your, your own things. And they also can come in with dried flowers. So um, another way that you can, uh, just to be safe, is you can actually freeze your food. Um, if, if you do have a major infestation, I, that's another way that you can, you can protect it, um, uh, to freeze the food, uh, to make sure that it's not infested, infested or becomes an infestation. Um, there are also some pheromone traps that can be helpful with this. Just keep in mind that those pheromone traps, you need to follow the label. Um, I've had, I've talked with people that have actually thought that if one trap is good, then many are great. But the problem is, is if you use a lot of pheromone traps throughout your house, they're not gonna work. Pheromone traps are there to lure the insect to the trap. But if you have multiple traps out there, then the pheromone is gonna be everywhere and they're not gonna know which way to go. So um, that's what you do. Um, Try to keep the infestation from even getting there in the first place. And then if you do have an infestation, here are some steps that will help. That's it for today. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Tamara. Okay. So the next thing that we are going to talk about, and you may have heard some of us talking about this. Um, let me get this pulled up here. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see that. So there were several of us in University of Missouri Extension that did some farmer to farmer training in the Bahamas last year and several of those people are on this um, garden hour today and we're going to tell you a little bit about our experiences there. And kind of to start out, um, yes, uh, when, when we told people that we were going to the Bahamas to do uh, training down there, we got a lot of eye rolls. Um, and yes, the Bahamas is beautiful. There's beautiful beaches, uh, rainbows. I mean, it's everything you would expect and more. 
but we were there to work. And so we're going to tell you a little bit about um, our experiences down there. And it all started with Hurricane Dorian. So Hurricane Dorian in 2019 was a Category 5 hurricane that hit the Bahamas. And it sat there over a couple of the islands for about 48 hours. And the result was that it was complete and utter devastation. There was nothing left. Um, and people were really in a bad way until help was able to arrive. Um, so that was in September of 2019. And then, of course, in March of 2020, uh, COVID hit. And any response organizations that were down there had to leave because of travel restrictions because of COVID. And so they kind of had a double whammy with, with bad luck happening all at one time. So Convoy of Hope was uh, one of the organizations that responded to the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian. And they are based in Springfield, Missouri. Probably a lot of you have heard about Convoy of Hope. And when they were responding to the Bahamas after the hurricane, one of the things that came out of the needs there was their need to be more self-sustainable. They import about 95% of their fresh fruits and vegetables, and they are a tropical climate, so they can grow things there, but they just don't. They rely heavily on imports. And so Convoy of Hope reached out to the University of Missouri to see if they would be interested in sending some folks like us down there to teach farmers and gardeners basically how to grow their own food. And so that's how it came about that we went down there to do these trainings. And so these were on three different islands in the Bahamas. And there's just, these are some photos of um, some of the classrooms that we taught. We taught in churches, we taught in community centers, and the people were very receptive to our trainings and um, thanked us for being there. And we would spend the morning about nine to noon doing a classroom session, and then we would break for lunch, and then we would have farm visits. And we would visit different types of farms, and uh, this one here was a was an avocado farm that we visited and i had no idea there were so many different types of avocados but there was and it was very interesting to learn about that and so each month um, two inu extension specialists would go down and teach a different topic and one of us would teach commercial farmers and one of us would one of us would teach backyard gardeners and here's kind of an overview of the different topics that we covered while we were down there. And so now each of us that win are going to tell you a little bit about our experiences. And I was down there in September with Jennifer Shooter. And probably one of the things that we enjoyed the most was our hosts on each of the islands. And you can see here, uh, the couple here on the right is the Lockhart's and on the left is Ryan. And we just really enjoyed spending time with the locals, teaching them, going in their gardens and farms, and just learning about everyday life in the Bahamas. The people there were incredible and that was by far our favorite part of the trip. Uh, next up is Katie, and Katie taught pruning and grafting. And Katie, what would you like to say about the trip? So as, as Kelly says, it's such an awesome experience. We learned so much. Uh, uh, we taught, but yet we also learned uh, uh, probably as much or more than what we taught. Uh, I went with a couple of row crop farmers from North Dakota, so um, not only did I get to experience the great uh, Bohemian people, I also got to uh, learn about agriculture in North Dakota, too, with my uh, partners. So um, my take home was I taught pruning and grafting and got to do some hands-on demonstrations of grafting. And on the left, you see a picture of um, basically some storm-damaged trees. Uh, and these were mangoes that um, he had grafted. Uh, this gentleman had actually um, knew the hurricanes were coming and he would go and cut scion wood. So at least he would save his favorite varieties of mangoes that way. 
Uh, the take home that um, surprised me wasn't something that I thought about was pruning their fruit trees. Uh, and the reason that this was revolutionary to them is um, they typically do not prune, but they understood that pruning means shorter trees, which means less hurricane damage. And uh, so that was one of the, the take homes that I got from it. And once again, awesome trip. All right, thank you, Katie. Okay, let's see if I can get my slides to change here. There we go. Okay, so uh, next up is Kathy Meacham and she is not with us this morning, but she did send a couple of slides to share and um, her favorite part, like all of us, was the people. The Bahamian people are wonderful. They're welcoming. They're open to us being there. They're appreciative of us being there. They have an incredible sense of community. And I think probably every one of us that went could say that the people was, was definitely one of our favorite parts. And then also Kathy wanted to share these photos of just some interesting things grow down there. Um, they do grow some things that we can grow here and some that we can't grow here. So despite some of their growing challenges, they are able to grow quite a variety of things and it was interesting to see that. Okay, she also wanted to share these photos and this was something that we saw a lot of while we were down there. And this was, um, you can see the pictures here of their pine forests that were destroyed because of the hurricane. When Hurricane Dorian hit, that caused a wall of seawater to flood the islands and that salty water caused massive losses in their pine trees. There was acres and acres and acres of just dead standing pine trees when we were down there. So, um, you know, that this kind of shows you the difference in some areas and then you're gonna see lush growth in other areas that weren't as hard hit. Okay, um, Tamara, you're up next. Thank you. So um, it, it just just a phenomenal trip. Um, my topics were actually on production and delivery schedules as well as integrated pest management. And I worked with the commercial growers. So my team, um, you can see in the bottom, Kathy and I were there together as well as Dan Cassidy and, and Brian. And they were a fantastic team as well as a lot of fun. So as you can imagine, I was very interested in the invertebrates of the Bahamas, as well as the horticulture. So in this slide, you can see some of what I came across. In that upper right hand side, that's a banana slug. It's a slightly smaller than my fist, um, so huge. Um, there was an aerial termite mound. Um, you can see where there's the pine tree and, and that mound, uh, it looks like soil, but that's actually termites in there. We don't have that species of termite here, but it was just really, really neat. Um, there were teeny tiny little bagworms about the size of an apple seed. Um, that, that was just really neat, something I hadn't seen here. And then, um, of course, you can imagine with that, that humid temperature um, or humidity and the temperature, there would be a lot of sooty mold that coated leaves due to aphid activity. So um, also thanks to my colleagues who went before, I was able to get a better idea of what IPM issues that they might be dealing with. For example, um, they deal with a lot of the same pests that we have, but slugs and snails were actually an even bigger problem. When So when I arrived, I learned of other invasive pests that they were dealing with, including sweet potato weevil and the papaya fruit fly. So I worked with farmers to help find IPM solutions and um, to learn more about how to search for credible research for these issues. So again, yes, the people were my favorite part of the trip, just their tenacity um, and, and desire to be able to find ways that they could grow. Um, we also went on a lot of farm tours, as you've heard. You can see in this slide that there are two of the farm tours that we attended. Um, Alpha Celestin, he had a banana farm and he taught us how to plant and care for bananas in the challenging soil or uh, rocks. <laughs> he also, he had to bring in a lot of soil as well as break up the rocks so the bananas could even get a footing. Um, then also uh, Stephanie Heald's backyard garden, you can see down in the corner. Uh, she actually was, uh, uh, she had just had an interesting interest in gardening when she started the program. But by the time Kathy and I were there in October, she had a yard full of plants in containers that she was taking with her to her new place. 
Something that we came across was the Liebig mealybug you can see in the top right corner. Um, it's also called the hibiscus mealybug. It's an invasive pest that was found on many of the plants we saw once we knew to look for it. And once we knew to look for it, then we could teach the other farmers about it. And I only knew about it because one of the farmers brought me a sample and I had to consult with a colleague in Florida. And that's when I learned about it, it as a, a highly uh, a, a pest that could infest different plants very, very quickly. Um, and so just a take home that I took from this, um, in addition to just, hey, I can do better in my garden when I don't have nearly the challenges that these people have. Um, but how important it is to, to be aware of the pests that you have. If you have questions, definitely talk to the extension so that you can find out what's going on. Um, this pest, it's, it is all over the place and it's devastating to many different crops. Um, as we were getting ready to come home, um, it became even more important for me to think about how to make sure that I was not going to allow this to spread to other farms as well as bring it home here. And so just making sure that if you are visiting another country um, or even just visiting farms, make sure you take proper precautions to not spread diseases. Make sure you wash your shoes and wash your clothes um, before you come home. So um, fantastic trip. It was so much fun. And that's that's what I'm going to share today. Okay, and just a couple more before we close out, if I can get to my slide to advance. Let's see. All right, there we go. Okay, Donna. Okay. Um, I, I think a lot of people have said a lot of things that we all feel about the Bahamas. Um, a couple of comments I wouldn't make. Um, I was just always, I was shocked about all the challenges that they have. Um, the lack of so topsoil. I mean, they're they're gardening in rocks, basically. It's just amazing they can do what they do. Um, and the fact that they um, are very loose on their definition of what a garden and what a farm is. And it just uh, sometimes it almost made me chuckle. But then in all seriousness, they were um, moving forward with what they had and made me smile because, hey, they're resilient and, and they are uh, focused on self-sustaining practices. They are determined not to let another hurricane take them down and not to let another episode like COVID leave them hungry and, and desperate to find food. They, uh, their, their main goal was to feed themselves no matter what. And so to, to me, that was just amazing. Um, we went to one grower, and that's the top left corner uh, picture that he just per, per, you know, produced lots and lots of plugs for a dollar a piece. So anybody could go there and buy tomato plants, pepper plants, herbs, all sorts of things. And it was so amazing. But the quantity he made just really inspired me to do more. The second picture, we were in the airport getting ready um, to go to the next island and happened to look up and there's this big postage stamp um, sign with and, and it had representative of every island that's in the Bahamas that is in, inhabitable. And so what, what really stuck with me was the fact that Bahamas had the family islands that are more focused on farming and family. And then they also had more of the urban, um, more of the um, uh, touristy type islands. I want to go back and I want to go visit some of those ones that are the family islands because I think it would be just so inspiring to see how the rest of the Bahamas live because it's not just one or two islands. It's lots and lots of islands. And um, of course, over to the right, the far right, um, it, we were there when a, hur a tropical storm was switching into a hurricane and this was last November. And um, it was so funny because we were sort of a little bit panicky, but then you look at all the natives and they're just going along like nothing's going to happen. And you know, we started to ask them, you know, when do we start panicking? And they're like, oh, no, this is no problem. If you don't see us panicking, don't you panic. You just keep going. But this was the storm surge that was from that tropical sun uh, or tropical storm. And, and the water was starting to get over the roads, which which was a little bit worrisome. But now it turned out to be nothing. And um, within a day, everything was back to back to normal mainly. And then of course the lower picture picture was the, the, the people. And, you know, it's amazing how, um, me and my husband, he came, my husband came for about three or four days. We went to local Wendy's and we just sat down and all of a sudden we were just inundated with, with people talking to us and finding out where we're at and sharing lots and lots of stories and lots of laughs. We had a really good time. And so definitely if any of you go to the Bahamas, make sure to look up a lot of those people and, 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 visit and get to know their culture because they are very happy people and amazing people. 
Okay, Kelly. <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, so we will let Debbie give a little report, and then I will let her um, close us out when she's done. All right, thanks. So um, just like everyone else, it was just an amazing trip, but my trip was a little bit different in the sense that Matt Herring, um, a, an agronomy specialist, and I were the very first two to go. We had no idea or no clue what we were going to be walking into. Um, we did the best that we could, and when we got back, um, we were inundated with questions from the rest of the group that were going to be following um, after us. So we were going to, Matt and I were going to talk about soils. So I have um, the very far left picture and the very, and the top middle picture. That's their soil. Think We think we have problems here in Missouri because we have rocky or clay soil. This is how those individuals are growing their crops predominantly. I think there's one or two islands that have really decent soil but the rest of them are pretty rocky. So here's some jalapenos growing in the garden. Here we have onions. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, and that's how they plant. But the thing that really caught me is that they do a lot of their own composting. Here's a bag that had um, a, a plastic bag that was arable. So water and um, air could really transfer through that. What's amazing is, is that because they're tropical, they have something or some sort of a tree that is growing year round that are always dropping leaves. So they would take those leaves, they would take um, some of the plant material, some of the different types of, of their, their fruit crops, vegetable crops that were not um, edible. They would throw that in there. You can see some on the back of the truck here that he was throwing into this bag and add a little bit of fertilizer, add a little bit of, of water to it, tie it up. Three months later, they would come back, open that bag, and that's what this would look like. So they were consistently working with making compost on an ongoing, regular basis. And then they would take this compost, they would then add it to the areas where they have, where they were trying to garden. And then after years, a number of years of adding compost to it with the soil that they did have there, because yes, rock is a breakdown that becomes our soil. And so this is what some of them end up working with as far as growing for their crops in that soil material. Um, it was just really amazing. The question I got on every single island for every single presentation was, tell us what you think about using seaweed as a fertilizer. My first comment initially back from to them was, well, I'll tell you what, I'm in from I'm from Missouri and I live a thousand miles from the water. And they all would laugh because that told them that I had no clue on how to use seaweed. But I did tell them is if it's seaweed and if it make sure you rinse it because it's going to have a lot of salt. A lot of our traditional vegetable crops, such as like the peppers the tomatoes, they don't grow in, in soils that have a lot of salt in it. Anything that's native to their islands are accustomed to that salt because they've got, when there's hurricanes and there's water that comes up with those surges, the soil gets full of salt. They have salt in the air, of course. So those, that's not a problem. But I really encourage them to rinse that seaweed, put it into their compost like this. <laughs> Sorry. And then go ahead and add that to their garden areas. The other thing that was very interesting is that the islands had become a tourist location. And so the government asked everyone to start looking and being trained on tourism. And they've been doing that for over 50 years. They've lost their agrarian historical knowledge. And so most of these folks are really going back and learning all the basics. They were so appreciative that they were there. They were just beautiful people. And with that, I'll go ahead and close out because I know we're over time. We will be back on April 5th and we will start to work on our weekly um, garden hours and we hope to see you then. Thanks. Hey, Jared, you got a minute? Yeah, one second. <laughs>